um, particular about the kind of paper that she uses. And in, in most cases, it's always handmade paper that she's, she has sourced from France, from Germany, from Nepal, from India. Um, and it's a really important kind of part of her decision making and, and artistic process. So Zarina says, watching paper being made and seeing the liquid paper pulp gave me all sorts of new ideas. Could I cast paper? The paper makers said it couldn't be done, but I kept thinking about it. Then in her early 30s, Zarina joined the Delhi Flying Club where she learned how to glide. She states, the vocabulary of flying became part of my vocabulary. She wrote a poem which states, I tried to fly, got lost in the thermal, could never go back, having lost the place to land. Zarina continues, these four lines are my whole biography. I can't go back because there's no place to land. Where will I go? It's important to note that Zarina's parents left their Aligarh house in 1959 and moved to Pakistan. The trauma associated with partition, which Zarina experienced as a child, and the attendant feeling of being in permanent exile has stayed with the artist. We will, be, we will be discussing this existential late motif in greater depth in the course of the lecture. In the 1970s, Zarina continued her exploration of the surface of paper by embossing, scratching, sewing, and piercing paper. Color by now had been eliminated from her practice, and this series of work was made entirely on white paper. Can you see the scratches? It's a very difficult image to actually see, but um, it's called fence. And um, oops, sorry. And you can see the kind of scratching that's happening on the surface of the paper. So this is the series that she started in the in the mid 70s. Paper is an organic material, almost like human skin. You can scratch it, you can mold it, it even ages, says Zarina. On a brief visit to New York in 1973, Zarina visited the retrospective of German-American artist Eva Hesse at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum. She says, I had never seen a show so luminous. I liked the transparency in her work and her cords and knots were like tangled lifelines. I also responded to the repetition of shapes. I too was very involved with the repetition of forms. According to Guggenheim curator Nancy Spector, artists working in the late 1960s were finding inspiration in the human body, random occurrence, the process of improvisation, and the liberating qualities of non-traditional materials such as industrial felt, molten lead, wax, and rubber. These artists mined a new aesthetic sensibility variously known as anti-form, post-minimalism, or process art. During her brief career, Eva Hesse contributed to this radical undermining of artistic convention with her abstract yet sensual sculptural works. Zarina still has the catalog from this exhibition in her, in her studio in New York. Um, and this is um, an example of the work that's in the Guggenheim's collection, but I looked up um, archival images of the retrospective from 1973, and this work was included in the retrospective. So it's a real example of something that she saw at the time. Zarina received a Japan Foundation grant in 1974 and moved to Tokyo. She contacted French Canadian priest Father Gaston Petty, who proceeded to employ her to make prints. Alongside working for Father Petty, Zarina made ends meet by working as an apprentice at the Toshi Yoshida studio, where she was able to learn about Japanese woodblock printing. After a brief stint in Los Angeles, Zarina moved to New York in 1976, where she was introduced by Krishna Reddy to legendary African-American artist, teacher, and printmaker, Robert or Bob Blackburn, founder of the printmaking workshop. Blackburn worked with lithography, woodcuts, monotypes, and intaglio prints. Um, so that's 
Bob Blackburn up here in his studio. And that's an example of one of his woodcut prints. This was the beginning of forming a community of like-minded artists for herself in the city. Unfortunately, in 1977, Saad Hashmi suddenly passed away. Zarina says, it was a difficult time in my life. I had very little money, was depressed, and never wanted to leave my house. I felt eaten away. I took a needle to paper and pierced it repeatedly. For months I stayed home, made my pin drawings, and thought about my life. Um, these are a very well-known series that some of you might have seen in person. Again, they translate quite poorly as images, but they're incredibly <coughs> sensual and visceral works. Um, and quite often on, on the back of the um, works on paper, you might find a pencil grid. Um, and, and Zarina said she was very interested in looking at the modern as a grid, grid as, a, as a point of departure, then finding her own way, her own methodology, her own kind of answer to that rigid hierarchy and, and creating a more sensual and perhaps more feminine response um, to that kind of received um, doctrine. What eventually drew Zarina out of her depression, as well as her home, was New York itself and Zarina's close friendships. One such formative friendship was with Cuban-American artist Anna Mendieta, who moved to New York in 1978 and had a solo exhibition of her photographs at the progressive all-female cooperative space AIR Gallery the following year. Sorry, the images are very, very large files. Okay. Um, so this is probably the best known series from Mendieta's practice, the Silhouetta series. Um, and this photograph, again, um, was part of the AIR show in um, 1979. Together with Mendieta, Zarina curated an exhibition at AIR titled Dialectics of Isolation, an exhibition of third world women artists in the United States. Zarina became greatly involved with the feminist movement and joined the faculty of the New York Feminist Art Institute, founded in 1979 by women artists and educators. She also became a member of the Heresies Collective, founded in 1976 as a discursive platform for feminism, politics, and art. The collective primarily oversaw the work of publishing their journal, Heresies, a feminist publication on art and politics, amongst other activities in the, cities, in the city. In 1979, Zarina helped publish an important issue as part of Heresies titled, Third World Women, the Politics of Being Other. She says, Working on this publication was an education on the issues faced by African Americans at that point. The unrest of the civil rights movement wasn't far behind us, and it was a learning experience to work alongside African American, Latino, and Caribbean artists. It was a time defined by women artists, by the likes of Louise Bourgeois, Harmony Hammond, Nancy Spiro, Mae Stevens, and many others. That's just another view of the pin drawings. Starting in the early 1980s, Zarina revisited her idea of casting paper using special plexiglass, plexiglass molds in order to make sculptural works. The ensuing body of work is the most colorful in her practice and includes an admixture of natural pigments and liquid paper pulp. This is also the time when Zarina first started to explore the notion of home.
alongside the cast paperwork, which include both architectural elements as well as flora and fauna drawn from the natural world, Zarina embarked on a series of cast bronzes inspired by her elder sister Rani's garden in Pakistan. You know, it was important to also include some less well-known work. Um, I think we all are more familiar perhaps with the pin drawings or with her uh, series of, um, you know, large woodblock prints. But these works from the 80s are um, somewhat forgotten because they've been dispersed into private collections. But I think it was really important to include them. Again, just to reiterate the fact that she isn't just a printmaker. She's also very much a sculptor. Um, and again, the scale is very, very important. Um, this is uh, an installation of the bronze works um, that we internally called Rani's Garden when we were mapping out the retrospective in New York. Um, and I think we were the only venue to show it um, in its full, you know, the idea of this enclosure or a private garden. Um, There were some elements that were included in at the Hammer in Los Angeles. You know, everything that she's ever made has always been done by herself. It's always been very in, intimate. It's always been related to what she can cope through her own body and through her own hands. So there's an intimacy that runs throughout throughout her practice. Um, this is an installation view at the Art Institute of Chicago. Just to show you different permutations of what curators do with an artist's work. Between 1992 and 1997, Zarina taught printmaking at the University of California at Santa Cruz, while also continuing her studio practice in New York. This constant journey across the United States as well as visits to Karachi to see her siblings and parents led to works such as Crawling House from 1994, one of the few sculptural installations in Zarina's practice and an important work in her oeuvre. With its inherent precariousness, each home literally hangs from a pin on the wall. and references to nomadism and, mig and migration. The work embodies both a sense of belonging as well as dislocation. such an inherent simplicity to all of it. That's what a great artist can do. <clears throat> in the portfolio of prints, Homes I Made, A Life in Nine Lines from 1997, Zarina provides us with an autobiographical roadmap through her life by creating essentialized floor plans of the spaces she has inhabited since first leaving India in 1958. Whereas Bangkok was her first home, Paris was where she watched the Seine flow by and waited for him to come home. Santa Cruz was a horizontal blue line. And New York is described by Zarina as a space to hide forever.
Um, I also thought you'd appreciate actually seeing her studio. Um,